Hello and welcome everyone to today's event, Iran protests, gender body politics and authoritarianism. My name is Nadia Lali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University. The event today is jointly co-hosted by the Watson Institute for International Studies and Public Affairs, the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown, as well as the Middle East Institute at Columbia University. In today's event, my colleague, Professor Catherine spellman Poots and myself will be in conversation with Professor Manija Nasrabadi. Now, before introducing the panelists, just a few words about structure. So Catherine, um, Manija and myself will be in conversation. Um, we would like to encourage you to use the Q&A function to pose any questions or comments. And uh, so we will have time for that uh, following our conversation. Just a few words uh, about context. I assume many of you are aware why we're here, what, why we are having this conversation. Uh, Mahsa Amini, who was a 22-year-old Kurdish-Iranian woman from Western Iran, was visiting her relatives in Tehran. She was pulled away from the subway by the so-called morality police for supposedly not being dressed appropriately according to the mandatory hijab law. She was detained and a few hours later, she was brought to hospital in a coma. Three days later, she was dead. Following her death, the Iranian authorities issued a statement denying any wrongdoing and, and they published a heavily edited video of Mahsa while in detention. Now, while many women have been arrested, tortured and killed by the Iranian authorities over the past years, Mahsa Amini's death sparked nationwide protests in many cities across Iran. Women and men from different ethnic backgrounds and social classes have come together to protest, not only against her death and the underlying mandatory hijab policy, but they seem to be challenging the very foundation of the Islamic Republic. So today we aim to go beyond the headlines to shed light on the meaning and potential for these protests. I'd like to now introduce uh, my colleague, Catherine Spellman. She is on the faculty at Columbia University and the Aga Khan University in London. Her work, mainly ethnographic, focuses on women and gender dynamics and Muslim communities in the UK and US. Over to you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Nadia. Um, yeah, well, we've been glued to the news in Iran. And it was last week after the Jadalia uh, panel, it was, a, it was an excellent panel that Nadia and I spoke and felt it was vital to continue the discussion um, to show our solidarity and most importantly, to amplify um, the bravery of the women and men um, who were risking their lives, who were being beaten, who were being arrested, who were being killed um, for uh, you know, on the streets of, of Iran. So we felt this was really important and, and, and even more so in the, latest, um, in the latest days where it's become even more brutal and more violent and, um, and the regime um, and other you know, countries and groupings are now creating their own narrative and creating their um, own agendas and advancing those and which is really decentering um, and silencing and, and eradic or trying to eradicate uh, all the work that uh, the people have been doing on the ground. Uh, so we felt that it was great to continue and really important to continue this conversation. And so we've invited um, our colleague, Manage Nazra Badi, um, who has been um, listening very closely to what's been happening on the ground. And, uh, and we know she can offer some great nuance and, and insight on what's been happening in Iran. Um, Manage is an assistant professor in women, gender, um, and sexuality studies at Barnard University, Barnard College, right here in New York. Uh, she has a book called The Flame Within, 
um, about Iranian revolutionaries in the United States, which is being published by Duke University Press, I think in the next couple of weeks, um, which is really incredibly timely. Um, her essays and articles have been published and have been forthcoming in, or forthcoming in a number of different publications, including the American Quarterly, the Journal of Asian American Studies, Routledge Handbook on the Global 60s, Scholar and Feminist Online, uh, Women, Women's Studies Quarterly, uh, Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, um, Social Texts Online, Jadalia.com, Tehran uh, Bureau.com, Bitarof, Kalalu, and, and so forth. Um, she's a member of Jadalia's Iran Page Editorial Board and a founding member of Raha, which is an Iranian feminist collective. So a very warm welcome to you, Mani J. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think we'll now turn the questions um, over to you, Nadia, to start. Yeah, well, thank you, Catherine, and welcome, Manije. So I already mentioned um, the sort of the issue that um, it's it seems that it's not the lifting of the um, mandatory veil legislation it seems to be not sufficient anymore in terms of the breadth of the demands that protesters are making. And so I'm I'm very much interested. I mean, when Katzer and I were talking about the event, you know, we we're wondering, so what are the various demands? What are the multiplicity of voices? Who are the people coming together? And also, you know, in which ways, I mean, what, what some of the um, really sort of what seems to be changing is the centrality of women's rights and that that is really galvanizing people, but also, you know, to address wider grievances. So I was wondering if you could talk um, to that set of issues, please. Absolutely. And first, I just want to thank both of you, Nadja and Catherine, for inviting me to speak with you today. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in. Um, the main demand of this uprising, which is now in its third week, is for an end to the Islamic Republic, an end to this form of government that has been in place for more than four decades. Um, there is an overwhelming rejection from wide sections of the society of a system that is really not working. It's not working economically. It's not working socially. It's not working politically. And the violent death of Jina Amini um, at the hands of this so-called mor morality police really has become a symbol for the entire patriarchal repressive state apparatus, right? Including the daily harassment by the state which demands control over women's bodies. Um, so there was, I think, an immediate identification that the destruction of Amini's young life resonated with the destruction um, of so many lives. I mean, some actually, you know, people dying, but also just the destruction in terms of hope for the future, the sense that your life is viable, the sense that you can live in a way that you, you know, can thrive, um, you know, that that all of this felt like it was kind of already destroyed, you know, for, um, for generations um, of, of people. Um, and so there was this incredible resonance. Um, the protests, of course, began in the Kurdish area of Iran, where Jina was from and spread across the entire country. And this is really significant that in every single province, um, there have been protests, you know, night after night. We've seen strikes in the bazaar, you know, uh, the kind of traditional, more religiously minded, you know, merchant center, right, have, have gone on strike. Um, the bazaar that was the backbone of the Iranian revolution in many ways, right? We've seen teacher strikes, student strikes. Um, we've seen, you know, the kind of neighborhood protests where people kind of go about their business during the day and then at night everyone goes out to the streets, right? Um, we have seen um, even, you know, young school girls, there's incredible footage now circulating on Twitter of, you know, young girls taking off their um, their hijabs that are part of their school uniforms and shouting down their male school official who kind of turns tail and runs out of the school courtyard, right? Um, so, you know, we've seen a proliferation of art of resistance um, filmmakers, singers, um, graphic designers, just an outpouring of um, cultural production that is circulating um, transnationally. Um, and I think the street protests have centered very often on 
women burning hijabs, dancing around bonfires, right? Um, almost a festival-like atmosphere um, at times. But then we've also seen the violence of the state cracking down. Um, it's hard to verify, but estimates are that well over 100 people um, have been killed and there have been mass arrests um, as well. So the protests are, Nadja, as you said, centering um, women's rights. They are women-led. They're infused with the mood of younger generations who have no ideological attachment to the government. Um, and very significantly, the protests have not only crossed kind of lines in terms of provinces and areas of Iran, but class lines really have brought out people from different class backgrounds. They have brought out religiously devout people as well as more secular people. Um, so there is this deep embodied sense, right, that the killing of Amini could happen to any woman any day, right, and that people are just not willing to continue to live like that under that daily fear. Um, and so that fear has really transformed now, you know, on the streets, in collective struggle, into an outpouring of defiance that has gone way beyond anything we've seen since 1979. And I'll just wrap up my answer by saying that one of the major demands coming out right now is a call for solidarity. Um, I was getting emails all day yesterday from students um, in Iran, um, you know, asking that faculty at institutions in the West condemn um, the terrible attack on Sharif University um, in Tehran, you know, with tear gas and bullets. Um, students were just disappeared, taken away. Um, and, you know, it's it's hard for most of us to imagine that kind of thing happening on our campuses. And there were professors who were beaten trying to protect students, you know. So I want to encourage um, folks listening um, to sign solidarity statements, to pressure your departments and administrations to condemn um, this violence so that we can really use our voices here to shine a light for the whole world to see what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I received some emails too, and I was glad to see that MESA, the Middle East Studies Association of Northern America, just issued actually a solidarity statement with mm -hmm. the students and faculty um, at university. Um, I see there are already questions coming in, but I'm going to now ask uh, Catherine to follow up. Yeah, we'll make sure to, to save time for, for a QA. and a um, Yeah, I just thought we could talk a bit about um, the, the history of uprisings and mobilizations in Iran that, of course, stretch back to the Constitutional Revolution um, in the beginning of the 20th century. And then we had, you know, many different, very, very different political groupings and voices that made up the Iranian Revolution, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, joined together to try to get rid of the Western Bakshaw. Uh, it was anti-imperialism and uh, against West toxification. Um, then we have the Green Movement in 2009, which was rejecting the fraudulent election results, um, which was, of course, sort of galvanized and symbolized by Neda, uh, Inga, Inga Sultan. Um, and then I think really importantly and, and least significantly, the um, protests that spread over at least 20 cities in uh, 2017 and 2019. Um, you know, uh, you know, calling an, an uprising against the uh, exorbitant fuel prices and bread prices at that time. So we have, a, you know, a long history of, of mass mobilizations, of protests. And I'm just wondering if you can try to contextualize this present uprising in relation to those. And also um, how this one is unprecedented with its motto of Zan Zendigi Azadi as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing in the longer. I mean, I, I think of it as like the, you know, the long Iranian freedom struggle, right? This long, unfinished, um, you know, desire for freedom that has gone through so many ideologies and iterations and, and experiments. Um, and I think the current uprising really does inherit the legacies of all of the past mobilizations that you mentioned, but it but it also moves in some really distinct new directions. Um, so first there, as you said, um, there is the fact that women's right to bodily autonomy, to be free of state control and violence is at the center. I can't emphasize the significance of this shift enough. Um, the last time there was mass resistance to the idea of compulsory hijab, um, was during the Iranian revolution. It was in March of 1979. Um, and actually I have a chapter of my book about this. Um, and there's a beautiful book about this by Negar Motadeh, Whisper Tapes as well that I highly recommend. Um, 
But, you know, at, at that time in March 1979, tens of thousands of women um, took to the streets. These were women who had helped to overthrow the Shah. Right? They were for the revolution, um, but they were also against mandatory hijab. And they rightly understood um, that the imposition of this kind of state control over women's bodies was part of a broader authoritarian turn, an anti-democratic turn that would see the curtailment of many, many rights, freedom of the press, assembly, um, and many other things. But at the time, issues of gender and sexuality were seen as side issues. You know, it was like, well, we'll deal with that after the revolution, right? A refrain that we've heard in so many anti-colonial revolutionary movements and settings. Um, it was seen as a side issue or even worse as divisive, right? As sowing disunity and kind of opening a weakness in the revolution that, you know, US or other foreign imperial powers might exploit. Um, the fact that those protests in 1979 were quite frankly contained to Tehran, they didn't spread nationally, and they were mostly um, educated, you know, educated urban women. All of this was sort of used against um, the women to say that, you know, you are elite, you are westernized, and your, your desires are, are illegitimate. Um, and that was unfortunately um, something that across the political spectrum, even the left, even the kind of liberals all agreed that these issues of bodily autonomy, hijab and the rest of it were um, were just not legitimate, were not important. Um, and um, and so, you know, that movement, um, while it, it did succeed initially, um, Khomeini did have to walk back the compulsory hijab initially, but over the course of the next few years, um, it did it did come in in practice and then by law in 1983. So um, even though women since then have been at the forefront of, um, you know, every every protest movement that's happened in the last 43 years. Right. Um, you know, the student movement that burst onto the scene in the late 1990s. Right. Um, women were involved. Women were right up in front in the 2009 um, you know, post-election democracy protests, right? But issues of women as second-class citizens, issues of bodily rights and gender, these were not on the agenda. Um, and that was true for the protests against the price rises in fuel hikes and things as well. Women participate. I mean, they're so directly impacted as the people who are responsible for everyone's survival, right? Deeply impacted by the economic crisis. But the issues of, you know, women's women's rights, women's liberation, second class citizenship, gender, these were not part of any of these um, movements. Um, so this is a really big change. Um, of course, in the last few years, there have been social media campaigns, some from inside Iran. Um, for example, the Girls of Revolution Street was one of these campaigns where women would take off their hijabs and take photos and those spread. So, you know, there has been this there's this precedent, right, to, uh, about this issue coming more into the fore. But now we have the unprecedented reality that there's a mass nationwide um, uprising of, of women and men that's, that understand that compulsory hijab is a foundational ideological pillar of the entire government, right? It's now the lightning rod for all of these desires for freedom, right? To be free of the regime in its entirety means you have to oppose compulsory hijab. Um, and so this is the second major point, um, is that the era of reform is over. You know, the, the era of reform that really um, began in the late 1990s with the election of um, Khatemi, which saw a lot of easing of restrictions and um, more support for culture and things like that. Um, you know, that, that whole era um, really was shut down after the 2009 um, movement was shut down um, and the leaders, you know, were are under house arrest still. So, you know, folks hit a dead end. People hit a dead end. And this time uh, there there is not a demand for reform or changing this or that law or electing this or that leader. Um, in fact, it is, um, you know, a, a desire for um, complete transformation. I think that is what is reflected in the slogan, Women, Life, Freedom, a slogan that goes back at least a decade to the feminist Kurdish movement. Um, and that does represent that desire uh, for a totally different society where the freedom of women would entail, you know, the freedom of, of all. Yeah, I think, and, and the fact that you said it's so widespread, this, this mm -hmm. protest, you know, in every city in Iran, the provinces, it's both rural, it's, it's rural, it, it, it encompasses so many of the different ethnic groups, language groups. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a good segue to your question, Nadia. About, yeah. the, about the northwest part of Iran and the Kurdish movement. Yeah, yeah, because I was um, sort of noticed that there is not, doesn't seem to be much discussion about the very fact 
uh, that um, Jine Mahsa Amini was Kurdish from the Kurdish um, majority area, I mean, the west of Iran, and knowing about the marginalization of Kurdish women, not only actually um, at the hands of the state, but even when I think about the Iranian women's movement, I mean, historically, that has been so middle class, urban based, uh, ethnic Iranian, and not paying too much attention to ethnic minorities, including, you know, Kurds. So I was wondering whether you can speak about the significance of her being Kurdish and the protest having started in the Kurdish region. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously, it is, of course, the more the PKK led Kurdish women's movement that centering, uh, you know, women's equality. And so how does link that? I mean, I think that's really quite substantial and amazing to my mind. Yeah, I've, I've seen a number of um you know, sentiments on social media from Iranians saying, you know, we were lied to by this government. We were told the Kurds were separatists and wanted to, you know, destroy our our nation. And, you know, we were we were lied to. And and so this is incredibly um, important, this moment. Um, and, you know, going back to 1979, you know, I talked about the women's uprising, but the other initial challenge to the consolidation of the Islamic Republic from its inception was in the Kurdish region, where there was an uprising in 1979 um, that was brutally suppressed by, I mean, it was actually, you, the suppression of that uprising was part of how the Islamic Republic consolidated itself, in fact, really, as it was coming into being. Um, so it's a really defining feature of this regime. Um, and, you know, for all of these decades, um, the Kurdistan area of Iran has been, um, uh, you know, targeted by militarism and violence repeatedly. Um, it's an incredibly poor area, really neglected and marginalized economically, and then, um, you know, subjected to um, incredible state violence, um, where any effort at equality, self-determination is labeled separatism, right? And then, it, and then the crackdown comes, you know, in the interests of sort of national security or integrity, right? Um, and so, I mean, even the Iranian government, you know, basically invaded um, the Kurdish areas just last week, right, with tanks and ballistic missiles, right? Um, so it, it, the repression even now looks different there than, you know, in Tehran. Um, and even they fired ballistic missiles into Iraqi Kurdish areas and killed civilians there. Um, so there's just been incredible brutality towards the Kurdish people. And because Amini was Kurdish and the protests started in her hometown and region, it's been impossible to ignore these connections between the systemic uh, persecution of women and the systemic persecution of ethnic and re religious mi minorities, right? There is what we might call an intersectional, uh, you know, understanding of the overlapping oppressions that Amini herself faced, right? That actually, and that actually do come together to undergird um, the regime. So the opposition to um, the regime's authoritarian approach to women is, is really inseparable. I mean, it's understood as sort of deeply intertwined with its authoritarian approach to the Kurds, right? And, and I think this is a new kind of sentiment, right? It's like a new sense that people have, right? Um, who are not Kurdish, of course, you know, who, are, who can make that connection now, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and also, as you said, Nadia, there's a very strong democratic and feminist movement um, among Kurdish people, especially, of course, in Rojava. Um, and so I do think this is um, inspiring and, and influencing um, the movement as a whole. But I think this is a, a moment in which the, the form of kind of um, Iranian nationalism, right, that, that has been so dominant um, in the government propaganda against the Kurds is really breaking down. Yes. Um, and so there's this new basis for, for unity in the opposition. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it reminds me a lot about what happened to the Turkish feminist movement that historically mm -hmm. was very Turkish nationalist and Kemalist mm -hmm. and in recent years has become so much more intersectional and where mm -hmm. the Kurdish question is at the center of the Turkish feminist movement. Uh, yeah, so, um, but uh, Catherine, you wanted to follow up with another set of questions. Yes, yeah, well, um, I thought we turned to your book um, as it is coming out in the next couple of weeks. And again, so it's called The Flame Within, Iranian Revolutionaries in the United States. And in it, um, you theorize about the affects of solidarity. And 
um, this is among the Iranian students in the 1960s and, and 1970s who participated in the Iranian revolution. <laughs> But not only that, they were also participating in wider movements, including the anti-racist movement, anti-colonial, and third world mm -hmm. feminist movements as well. Um, so I thought maybe you could talk about your conceptualization of the effects of solidarity, of this revolutionary effects that you conceptualize in the book, and how it might be applied to the current uprising. Yes, thank you for that question, absolutely. So. Yes, my, my book, um, This Flame Within, it looks at the diasporic Iranian student left in the United States in the 1960s and 70s, um, which of course was a time when uh, the Shah um, was a major US ally. And so, um, you know, under that time of the Shah, thousands and thousands of Iranians were coming to the US um, and going to other countries as well, mostly in Europe um, and uh, Canada to study abroad, right? To get their Western degree and then go back home and essentially kind of help to run the, the modernization of a kind of Western capitalist, you know, development scheme. Um, but so I wanted to understand how, what happened that some significant minority of those students, thousands of them um, decided to, uh, really abandon that mission entirely and to use their time in the West um, to agitate and organize for the overthrow of the Shah's dictatorship and the end of US support um, for that, that government. Um, so I, I interviewed um, over 30 people. I did a lot of archival research and you know, I was asking people, so, you know, how did you become political? Like, why did you come to the U.S. and like spend all your time organizing for a revolution instead of studying? Like, what happened, you know? Um, and what I heard were these just extraordinary stories of the lived experience of growing up under the dictatorship. Um, in Iran, you know, people had memories of the CIA coup and its aftermath. They had memories of state repression. They had relatives who were part of different opposition groups, the Communist Party. Um, they had, you know, they had all of these encounters with the kind of long Iranian freedom struggle and with different iterations of um, state repression and militarism um, that they kind of carried with them, you know, these kind of embodied memories that lived inside of them and traveled with them when they came to the US um, long before many of them were, you know, had a particular ideology, um, but were um, kind of these latent energies that could then be mobilized and channeled towards political activity in the context of, um, you know, third world internationalism in the context of um, student movements already underway um, in places like the United States. And so I, um, you know, I theorize about that kind of affective and emotional dimensions of revolutionary subjectivity and activity. Um, and I also tried to think about how it was that that desire for revolution in Iran um, attached also to the revolutionary hopes and dreams of others. Um, so that you have Iranians being very active in the movement against the war in Vietnam, being very active in the Palestinian liberation movement, um, joining protests to free Huey Newton, you know, understanding that, you know, state repression, right, injustice, you know, even if they had a very different version of it, right, but they could at an affective level, at the level of the body, they could make those connections and it brought them into the streets again and again to support um, the, the liberation movements of, of others. So I do think that um, we see this playing out now. I mean, I, we're very much at the beginning, this is like week three, um, but I think that we see the way that affect, that memory, that embodied memories of um, encounters with state repression has absolutely been channeled into collective struggle in the streets right now. So that what once might have been a private humiliation or a daily fear um, you know, of, of the morality police, for example, of being thrown out of university for not wearing proper hijab, all of these things that you might that might have made people depressed, despondent, um, you know, beaten down or just trying to leave the country. The, these same embodied memories are now attaching to the desire for revolution, right? They, they, they are circulating and accumulating and taking on new meaning as people um, are transformed themselves in the context of these collective actions um, to, to change things. And as far as solidarity, I mean, we'll have to see. I mean, my hope is that um, is that many other groups who are also fighting authoritarianism and patriarchy and for bodily autonomy, gender and sexual freedoms will understand that this struggle in Iran is connected and that we will be able to forge new um, new links um, and new bonds of solidarity in this moment. Yeah, great. Well, that just makes me you know, think of the interviews that I did in the past with students who 
came to the West um, mm -hmm. after fighting against the Shah in the 1960s and 70s and, and often telling um, me about their experiences in jail and prison and, and you know, had lots of I've heard many stories about Avin, for example, the prison. Mm -hmm. right. And so I was really struck by some of the chants coming from the uprisings right now in Iran with people saying, uh, Avin is, uh, is our university. Is it, it's now become a university and Tehran is a detention center. And just to think about some of the parallels there, um, which, which made, reminded me of your, of your book. Uh, yeah, Nadia, do you want to? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I suggest that um, I ask one more set of questions and then Catherine, then we move to the uh, questions from the audience because we have many. Um, so I actually am going to put together a couple of questions I had in mind, which sort of actually uh, build on what you were just saying in terms of solidarity. And I'm thinking here about the large Iranian diaspora in the US, mm -hmm. but also in many other countries around the globe. You know, how has the diaspora been mobilizing? How is the diaspora actually responding to calls um, from to calls of solidarity from people inside of Iran? And what are some of the main shifts? Because I also have been following uh, Iranian, especially Iranian feminist diaspora mobilization, and in the past it's been extremely polarized, especially around questions, sanctions, economic sanctions, and the threat of war. Uh, which I think I would also like you to briefly address because um, to my mind, uh, there seems to be sort of a mismatch now in the way that the Western media is thinking uh, and discussing Iran uh, because sanctions are not being addressed. We know that sanctions are not helping the women of Iran. So I was wondering if you can say a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. It is a kind of... Um... It is a, um, a moment of abrupt and sudden shifts where um, some of like the Iranian American organizations that have been so focused on um, restarting the nuclear deal as a way to get sanctions relief and sort of normalize relations, you know, suddenly have shifted to just supporting the revolution, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of Iranians have said, you know, uh, we don't want the United States government to negotiate with the regime. You know, they shouldn't negotiate with these quote unquote terrorists, you know. And so, you know, this is, it's complicated, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, um, I mean, I'm someone who's done anti-sanctions organizing and activism for many, many years and actually started doing that around Iraq um, yes. a long time ago. And so we know, <laughs> we know that sanctions are collective punishment. They immiserate ordinary people. Um, and they can pave the way for war, right? We, we have seen this tragically um, in Iraq and we, I don't want, and most Iranians do not want a repeat of that, right? But at the same time, it is true that on the ground in Iran, sanctions are not the main thing on people's minds, you know? And I mean, this has been true for a long time, you know, as an American, whenever I would go to Iran and try to talk about sanctions, all people wanted to talk about was how much they hate their own government, you know? Mm -hmm. And I would be the one being like, yes, but isn't the US also part of the problem? Oh yeah, 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 of course, but really, you know? And mm -hmm. so for people there, you know, sanctions is, it's been a constant, you know, it's 43 years of sanctions. And it's, I mean, it got worse under Trump, of course, you know? Um, but, um, but you know, there's this sense that if, if they can overthrow the government, you know, all of that other stuff won't matter. But I think that for those of us in the US, it's different. I think here we have, um, an ethical responsibility, right, to condemn sanctions um, and to really be clear that the U.S. government is not, um, a, you know, a benign force that's going to assist in the liberation of Iranian women or any Iranians, you know. Um, and so there may be some uh, debates and disagreements about that in the diaspora. I know that there's at least one very, very prominent um, Iranian feminist in New York who's been on CNN arguing essentially that we need more sanctions um, to you know help liberate you know Iranian women and, and and but but most people really cringe at that and I don't think that that position has um, a base of support certainly not in Iran um, I think what we've seen in the diaspora is actually um, even it's very different from 2009 um, since 2009 many many more young people have left Iran. They have come on student visas, so they're temporary. They, they, their status is temporary. They're still very connected to Iran. We're not talking about the exilic community that came in 1979 and could never go back. We're talking about people who grew up, um, you know, during the, you know, were born during the Iran-Iraq War, grew up in the Islamic Republic, um, and have experienced 
the, the harassment of the morality police have grown up with that fear and those insults and humiliations um, and are in constant contact with their loved ones, you know, who are out on the streets every night risking their lives, right? So there's a deep connection um, going on um, to, to the movement there and um, the desire to be in solidarity. And I think that solidarity um, um, is also being expressed uh, with a new call for an, uh, transnational feminism, a transnational feminist movement, right? That can connect the struggles against authoritarian um, patriarchal state violence um, around the world, including right here in the United States. And I think that's also an important shift is that instead of a discourse of sort of the liberated Western woman who's supposed to save or help, you know, the oppressed Muslim women. I, I think that things have really dramatically changed. Not only should that discourse have been discredited once and for all because of the debacles um, in Afghanistan and the devastation that the U.S. brought there, but there's, you know, Iranian women are leading. They're out in front. I mean, they're absolutely leading the way. And we've had the overturn of Roe v. Wade in this country. So the idea that we're all free here, I don't know anybody who thinks that anymore, right? In fact, we have to fight for our bodily autonomy and rights. We are not equal right here. And so this is potentially a moment where we can come together as peers, right? In in linked, but but you know, distinct struggles, you know, for, for, for things that are really ultimately maybe not that different um, and kind of break down some of those hierarchies that I think really got in the way of building um, international feminist solidarity in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, felt for a long time and I mean, uh, Catherine, uh, myself and Denise Candiotti have been writing about the need to really rethink the way that we categorize the world into, you know, West and uh, Middle East Muslim majority countries, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to women's rights. Yeah, um, Catherine, would you like to ask one more question before we look at the questions from the audience? I think I'd be really selfish if I did that because there's so many great questions and we only have 20 minutes left. Yeah. What do you think? Um, well, do you want to choose a couple of questions then from the audience? Sure. Um, this one from, from Mary Hegland. Hello, Mary. I hope that you're well. Um, so she's asking, what effects do you think the participation of schoolgirls, groups of high school girls can have? Surely the regime won't dare to harm them? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I had that, I mean, thank you for that question, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, I had that same thought, you know, there's um, this incredible video um, going around on Twitter right now of, um, you know, yeah, school girls, maybe middle school or high school, it's not clear um, in their in their school courtyard. I think I may was, maybe was talking about it earlier, but it's it's just so moving because there's, they're just this absolutely confident, completely like clear, you know, um, group, they take off their, their headscarves and they just shout down the school official. I mean, they're not taking any nonsense anymore. And I had the same thought that, you know, um, surely, you know, their youth <laughs> may, may be a shield, you know, that surely, I mean, I, I, I have no idea. I think that the, you know, um, like, like so many governments, um, they're likely to do whatever, they can figure out to do to stay in power. And so actually um, overthrowing this government, actually changing it is, is just, it's no small task. Um, and so I, I very much hope that um, the, the extreme youth of, of those girls will, um, will keep them safe. But I think we have to keep paying attention and keep watching and keep sharing the stories and keep amplifying the voices to make the, pol you know, the political cost of repression um, you know, very, very high. Um, in terms of a, of a grassroots and international response um, from ordinary people who are not going to stand by and, and watch that sort of thing go down. There was a, that other um, video that was circulating. I don't know if you saw it, you saw it, but it's with the group of girls who were standing in front of a chalkboard with out their hijabs on. You could see all of their hair and then on the chalkboard, the, the lyrics of the song that was created by Shireen Hajipur Mm -hmm. who um, has now been arrested, I believe, yeah. after his really quite amazing song, which was made up of uh, different tweets um, about the protests and in a really beautifully done way. And yeah. he's been arrested now after it being circulated 40 million times or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I mean, this is an amazing example of like what we were talking about initially of how 
um, how the issue of state control over women's bodies is a flashpoint for all of the grievances because the, the hashtag Baraye for became this way for people to add an, yet another reason for the revolution, right? Another, and, and for this, and for this, right? It's like piling on the grievances, piling on um, the, the demands. And yeah, he turned that into a, a beautiful and moving song um, posted online and then was subsequently arrested. And this keeps happening. We see incredible images and videos posted online. And then we hear now this person was arrested. Now this journalist was arrested. Now this, mm -hmm. you know, and so this is just a constant unfolding um, you know, situation of, of repression that people are facing. Mm. Catherine, I was wondering whether we could follow up um, with a question by Yusuf Umretwala, because I think that's it's really um, quite poignant. Um, Yusuf is asking us, or was asking you, Manije, what is the stance of the Supreme Islamic Academy in Qum on this? Are they in solidarity with the movement or in opposition? In general, how are religious bodies in Iran reacting to this? They might be against the ruling body, but what do they say on women's rights and hijab in particular? Yeah, thank you for that question. So the as far as the official Supreme Council in Rome, I, I don't know if they have issued, I, I don't know. What I do know is that a group of clerics who are, you know, instructors in the seminaries have issued a statement saying that to support this regime is un-Islamic. Okay, so this isn't the official body. This is a group of clerics, right? But nonetheless, what does that mean, right? Um, that's a huge that's a huge provocation and a huge challenge. Um, and I don't know what is going to happen to them, but what it what it it it's deeply significant because I think that um, it would be truly problematic to characterize. Um, what's happening in Iran along a kind of secular versus religious binary, right? Instead, what we see is um, secular people, devout people, all kinds of people coming together to say, this is, we don't want a government that, um, you know, does these things in the name of Islam, right? And so there's a sense among a lot of religious people that, um, that Islam is being misused, um, that the government are hypocrites, they're not real Muslim, you know, all this is a one of the counter discourses, one of the discourses of resistance is absolutely around um, reclaiming, you know, Islam away from um, the government, um, you know, and, and, um, you know, and at the same time, of course, many, many people, regardless of their religious religiosity, um, are coming together to say we want a secular government right now, that is a demand that we hear um, again and again. Yeah. Um, I just want to, before we uh, go to more of the questions, I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm just thinking about my, my friends and my students who do wear the hijab and who are in full support of the uprisings in Iran and are fighting for bodily autonomy themselves and fighting against oppression. Um, but they're also worried about Islamophobia and worried about the, the media, some media and uh, particularly some far right media who are um, not really, I guess, you know, have been focusing on the hijab and sort of divorcing the symbolic acts of hijab burning mm -hmm. from the Iranian context. And the hijab has a particular context in Iran in the way it's been politicized, which is very different in other circumstances and uh, around um, the world. So I'm just wondering if you could talk about the problems of reducing the protest movement to the, um, the to the question of unveiling. Yeah, th th I mean, this is one of the trickiest things in my, I mean, one of my concerns is actually that if we can't think clearly about this issue, um, people who, who understandably want to oppose Islamophobia and don't want to fuel the kind of right-wing neocon currents will, will hold back, will hesitate from being from supporting the movement, maybe because they're worried, they don't know how to navigate some of this because it is very tricky um, and very difficult. But I think context is everything. This, um, you know, this is a movement against compulsory hijab. This is about state power, right? Um, if if we don't understand that this is about the state controlling women's bodies, um, then we've not only missed the point, but there is this tremendous danger of um, co-optation, misrepresentation. Um, for an agenda that has nothing in common with what people in Iran are fighting for. People in Iran don't want, you know, foreign 
intervention, right? Um, so these protests are not against Islam, as I was saying. We have clerics saying the government is un-Islamic. It's un-Islamic to support the government, right? Um, so, um, you know, I think there, the, what, we, what we have to be clear about is that there's no universal hijab. You know, there's, you know, the hijab always has a context. It always has a place and a location and a history, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the Islamophobia in the West that's been used to justify wars and occupations, you know, we, there's, there's no contradiction between opposing that completely and unequivocally and supporting the self-determination of Iranian people. The right to wear hijab or not wear hijab should reside with women, right? Not states. Um, wearing or not wearing hijab should not be the basis for persecution or discrimination. Um, so, you know, the same way that, you know, I would protest for the right for Muslim women to wear hijab in a place like France or the United States, I would protest for the right of Iranian women not to wear hijab, right? Um, so this really is something that um, I think uh, resonates deeply with, with women all over the world. You know, the way that women here, we want to control our own reproductive systems. You know, we don't want the state telling us. I mean, it's, it's a very, you know, it's, a, it's about the body, right? It's about your, it's about your control over one's own um, you know, body and to be free of the repressive apparatus of the state. Um, yeah. Absolutely. yeah, and if I can just come in here, Manij and Catherine, and we see that actually also in other protest movements in the region. I mean, you say globally in the West, but I'm thinking of particularly, um, you know, Lebanon, Iraq, Turkey. Um, there has been this overall shift where um, the struggle for women's rights, for the control of their bodies and sexuality has become more generally a center cause for a wider political struggle. So we definitely see something happening um, at regional and global level as well. Absolutely. Gosh, we're now to 15 questions. Um, Catherine, you want to go ahead and, and maybe uh, take three and then I'll take the next three. Uh, yes, I, I think should we group them together? Um, there's some, there's a, a question from Isabella Titi and Fatima Madaris and Michael Rostam. Um, so Isabella is, is with the support of Western imperial powers of these protests. How can one reconcile wanting to stand with the women in Iran and their grievances without wanting to support Western imperial co-option of the struggle? Well, <laughs> first of all, we have to we have to start with the protests on the ground in Iran. We have to start with actually supporting self determination for the Iranian people. Um, and you know, Western governments, um, you know, have have issued various statements. But we have to be really careful about this because we also have the Iranian government, um, the supreme leader, and the president who are saying that all of the protests are inspired by Israel and the United States, and therefore are you know basically like foreign agents um, running amok and that none of it is legitimate. And this is really dangerous rhetoric, right? Because um, this can justify, uh, you know, massive brutality, massive crushing of, of dissent. So I think it's very important. The starting point has to be that, um, that these protests, this unfolding revolution is legitimate. It is popular. It is from below. It is grassroots. Um, it is not being done in the name of any foreign government. Um, and, um, you know, the governments will always try to cynically manipulate situations to their own interests. But I think we just have to be really clear that the interests of ordinary people in Iran and those of us who want to support their right to determine their own future are um, irreconcilable with the interests of Western states that want to extend their domination um, over the region. So I think we have to build an alternative um, of grassroots solidarity instead of looking to governments um, in the West to so-called support the Iranian people. Mm. Sorry, Catherine, I just see that you see a little bit down, Yeshim Arad, her question really links to this because she's asking, um, is there a possibility that solidarity statements signed in the West backfire in Iran, given precisely what you've just described, Manija, yeah. and the mullahs could believe responding to those demands could be interpreted as a sign of weakness? What would your answer to that? That's, that's a really interesting question, and it has a historical precedent um, that's that's very important, which is that um, during 1979, when um, 
women were, were, were rising up in Tehran against compulsory hijab, um, a, a few um, Western fe white feminists um, had been invited to come and speak and support the Iranian women's movement. They came in a spirit of like global sisterhood, um, but they didn't really understand the context and they were not um, sensitive to the way that their presence could be used, right? And at that time, um, their presence was used um, by the, um, the the provisional government to basically say, you know, all of the women are westernized and all of the women are agents of the West and um, to to sort of like undermine um, and, and um, delegitimize um, the women's demands um, by the presence of like a handful of Western, you know, feminists. So, I mean, that's a very cynical, you know, most of the Iranian women on the streets didn't even know those Western women were there. <laughs> you know what I mean? They weren't really relevant or leading or anything, but they, their presence was used in a way that was very damaging um, ideologically to the movement. Today, things are just so different. The statements that folks are issuing in the West are in direct response to the call for solidarity coming from people on the ground in Iran. We are being asked um, to write these statements. We are being asked to respond. What people want is for their, their cause to be known everywhere. They, want, um, they don't want to be isolated. They don't want to be in darkness and silence. You know, the Iranian government keeps shutting the internet down. You know, that is, is really terrible, right, for people. You know, they, they want the images, the news. They want all of this to get out. They want this to circulate. They want their struggle to be a beacon for people fighting for justice and freedom everywhere in the world. And so we're very much responding to that. And this is really important because it's an opportunity to challenge the idea that everyone in the West is somehow promoting a kind of Western imperial agenda. It's a, it's a new moment to reclaim a kind of internationalism from below outside of these circuits of, of governments, right? And I think it's hard for us to imagine because it hasn't happened for many, many decades. We haven't had, you know, um, internationalism from below as like an actual political force in the world, arguably maybe since the 1970s, right? So, um, and and it's and it's its ideological basis has to be, you know, different now, as we've been saying, um, you know, feminist, and, you know, from the from the beginning, um, and the rest of it. But I think that this is um, this is not a moment for us. I mean, you know. I, each of us who's signing these statements, hopefully we're doing it because we really believe in the um, the ability uh, of Iranian people to liberate themselves. Um, and we want to support um, them having the political space, the freedom from you know bullets and mass arrests so that they have time to actually develop this movement and figure out what kind of society they want to live in. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I think there's a question that's looking at things through a different lens that maybe um, Fatima Madaras um, mm -hmm. writes, in terms of Iran protest in the US media and academia, why doesn't someone write about the role of the West, the West cyber war, Islamophobia, regime change, and color revolution, and um, the terrorist groups such as the MEK, inflation rates, um, and reasons rather than the narrow-minded line of feminism that is a defeated approach even in the West? Well, I think we have a disagreement about feminism being narrow and feminism being defeated. I actually think feminism is um, in the in the way that it's being enacted on the ground in Iran and other contexts is fantastically capacious, that it's about the liberation of humanity um, and arguably the planet. Um, so I, I disagree with that. Um, and, you know, I also I also think that these sorts of like the, the MEK and um, the whole idea that like everything in Iran is being manipulated by foreign powers and um, you know, this is, it's too cynical an approach. Um, I, I don't buy it. People said that in 2009 too. Um, and I, I just don't think that it's accurate. Um, I think that there's, that there are legitimate demands. And we also have to imagine that Iranian people can actually, you know, think for themselves and have agency and organize and that they're not simply being, you know, um, sort of brainwashed or manipulated by sort of the, the internet or what have you. In fact, I think the opposite, I think people are in a, in a situation in which they are, um, creating new forms. They're, they're in, a, in, a, in a situation of tremendous um, innovation, creativity, ferment, um, daily trying to figure out what's the next strategy? How can we sustain this? How can we extend this struggle, right? On the ground, in conversations with one another, using social media when they can access it to, to share their message with the world. Um, but, I, but I think that we should sort of resist a very cynical sort of top-down understanding of what's happening there. 
Nadia, did you want to jump in? No. Oh, I think you're muted, Nadia. Oh, Nadia, yeah, sorry. Apologies, yes. So uh, as we're running out of time, uh, maybe one last question I see here by Kylie Golsa, who uh, says, as an Iranian American, I'm doing all that I know of to support voices inside Iran, consistently posting, do, doing what I can to get non-Iranians involved, going to protests and continuously informing myself and those in my life. It doesn't feel like enough. What else can I do? Thank you for your time. And maybe linked to that also, if you can sort of reflect a little bit on the protest this weekend and yeah. the kind of slogan that were shouted. I know that Catherine, you also went to the protest in New York. So maybe you can just um, to conclude, say a little bit about that. Well, I very much, I appreciate that question and I share those sentiments. I think um, like you, many of us um, have been constantly posting and, and you know, doing everything we can. We're sort of vicariously, you know, living, <laughs> trying to follow things and trying to um, stay connected. And yeah, I think, um, I think that the the International Day of Feminist Solidarity that was called this past Sunday, October second, was um, incredibly significant. Um, there was a there was another Global Day of Solidarity called on Saturday, which was fantastic as well, and thousands of people came out in cities around um, the world. But the significance of the Sunday event, I wanted to just emphasize. Um, I was involved with the local New York City action here because it was called by a kind of new ad hoc formation, Feminists for Jena. Um, and some of the people at the at the heart of that were um, our Iranian feminists who were involved in the One Million Signatures campaign in Iran in the uh, late 2000, in like to around 2006 up until 2009, where they were um, trying to collect signatures to overturn 10 discriminatory um, laws against women in Iran. And that was really one of the um, main kind of above ground grassroots feminist movements that we've had, you know, in, um, in Iranian society. And many of those women are now in exile and they put out this call. Um, and so, um, you know, we had um, solidarity actions that were really centering um, the, the fight for bodily autonomy and gender and sexual justice. Um, and here in New York, it was incredibly moving. I mean, there, like I said, there are so many Iranians who have come recently um, to the US. They grew up in the Islamic Republic. They have direct experience of um, kind of living with the kind of daily authoritarianism around um, gender and the body. And so there, there was this sort of just collective kind of outpouring of like, rage and grief and defiance. Um, women came forward and cut their hair in a symbolic gesture of solidarity. Um, we sang the feminist anthem that's been sung, you know, in the streets in, in Farsi. We had signs in Kurdish um, trying, we had, you know, Kurdish speakers um, talk about the connections to the Kurdish movement. We had solidarity statements um, coming in from all around the world. I think we only had time to read one from Afghan poets and, and writers. Um, but, you know, there was this absolute sense that um, women around the world were looking to the Iranian women and, and following their struggle and, and understanding our struggles is linked. And I think that we have to look for those opportunities, right, to bring people together and try to connect what's happening in Iran to the abolitionist and feminist movements um, that are going on around us to sort of forge that that those new affects of solidarity, those new internationalist links um, that can sustain us. Just just to yeah. quickly add to that, I spoke to my friend from Kabul who said that they yeah. uh, went out in front of the Iranian embassy in Kabul at incredible risk and yeah. in, in, to, in support of, of Basa Amani and the Taliban came straight away and yeah made them disperse, um, beat some people up, you know, fired some guns. And, you know, so the, the amount of uh, the bravery that people yes. have around the world to support the, uh, the Iranian cause is really remarkable. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we've run off, out of time. There are many, many more questions. There's, of course, a lot to discuss. Uh, personally, I feel incredibly humbled and inspired by the courage um, by Iranian women and men in Iran and also in the diaspora. And um, I hope that um, we'll see, uh, of course, that they will succeed in some, you know, at least some of their demands. I mean, I, having seen the various protest movements in the Middle East, I'm sort of obviously inspired and hopeful, but also 
worried. Um, it can go into so many different directions. Yes. But this is um, this is a time where we all need to step up and be in solidarity and see the connections um, move beyond, I guess, our comfort zones. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Manija, for joining us today. Uh, I know it's not uh, easy to keep talking about these events, and I'm very conscious as, that as we are talking in the safety of our Zoom rooms, um, students and faculty at Sharif University and possibly other universities in Iran are actually risking their lives. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to put that on record and send my solidarity with everyone. Thank you, Manija. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, all of you who have joined us today. Thank you so much for inviting me, for everyone for being here. Thank you.